Good morning, Crossroads. Are you ready to worship? All right, get on your feet. You'll just fill it out, and we'll have a record of your visit. So, let's continue to worship. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. As 
I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I'm safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against? There's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. When all I see is a cross, God, you see. the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. for us, God, when we are in a battle, when we are, when we are called to fight it, God, we can fight it on you, and then we're not fighting it alone, that 
you're with us and you're fighting for us. Today, God, we lay every every burden, every trouble, every every bad thing, every sin in our life, God, we lay it down at your feet. We praise you that you do accept us through the blood of Jesus. And it's not based on our own works, but based on his sacrifice, we're justified. God, thank you in Jesus. It's in your name we pray. you bring when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you you bring when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you we worship you Yeah. 
Jesus, we love you, and we can't get enough, all this is for you, been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I've held everything together and watched it shine. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards the rain. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Wondered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. And every time I turn. Your love's too 
kind of love is who you are. It's a grace I can never add up to, to be somebody who still walks. Somehow, you love me as you find me. You love me as you find me. You may be seated. So I was, we were singing that song, and I realized uh, as I was thinking about that, I've been talking to you guys about The Chosen, and if you haven't uh, downloaded The Chosen app and started watching The Chosen, I strongly recommend that you do that. Um, it will open up a brand new way for you to kind of look at the scriptures because you see it kind of unfolding before your eyes. Uh, in a different way. And I told you, they, they do a really good job of staying true to the theology of the Scripture. It's the little things that we don't really know or that the Bible doesn't tell us that they get to have a little creative license with that is uh, just phenomenal in the way they handle that. But I was thinking, those of you who have seen it, um, and this, I know this group over here has seen it, don't you think that could be the theme song for the whole, for the whole series, that, that song? Because everybody Jesus encounters initially they have no idea who he is, right? And, he's, and he goes to where they are. They don't feel worthy. And he says, but I came here for you. I didn't come for anybody else. I came for you, right? And it's so amazing. And then I was thinking about, uh, and it's not really a spoiler. Um, if it is, you should have watched it. Uh, but I, I will tell you that um, this last episode that I watched um, is really phenomenal because um, the Mary Magdalene character uh, is you know, Jesus has really brought her, just redeemed her whole life. And she takes a big step backwards and just really blows it in her mind. When she finally comes back face to face with Jesus, she says, hey, I, I blew it, basically. Um, you redeemed me, and I, and I just kind of, you know, lost, lost it. And he said, wow. It's not much of a redemption if you can lose it in one day. And I just thought that whole song just kind of just kind of encapsulates exactly that sentiment, right? That Jesus is there. And we, yes, we're going to mess up. Yes, we're going to, ideally, we're not ever going to mess up, right? Y'all know me, right? <laughs> if you don't, get to know me. You'll know, yes, we are all going to mess up. But the reality is, Jesus loves us right where we are. In the middle of our big old messes, Jesus loves us. But here's the great thing. He loves us too much to leave us in that big old mess. He wants to get us out of that mess. He has a better plan. I hope by now, for at least for those of you who have been coming to Crossroads for any length of time, that you understand what, that we believe that. Um, he loves us right where he is, but he's got a plan, a bigger plan than we can ever ever imagine. Well, we are in our series. If you're our guest today, we're so glad that you're here. Make sure you fill out a welcome card on the way out. Miss Belinda will be out there at the table, and we have a gift for you. But uh, for those of you who are new, let me just say um, the series that we're going through is called A Walk to Be Remembered. Uh, we're calling it that because we are taking a walk through the New Testament. And it is not, it is not a fast-paced walk, as we have seen. Stop it. It's not a fast-paced walk. Uh, some of my staff are giving me a hard time about that. It's not a fast-paced walk. It's a slow walk through the New Testament. But why do we want to rush through the Bible, right? We don't want to rush through the Bible. Um, so we are, we started at Christmas in Matthew, at the Christmas story, and we are way over to Matthew 15, all right? So we are, we are moving right along at a snail's pace. So, but it is, we are, I think, understanding a little bit more how the story fits together. That's the goal, is that we are not biblically illiterate people. So we're going to walk through the entire New Testament. So the series is A Walk to Be Remembered, if you're taking notes, as some of you do, and I appreciate that. It is, uh, the title of the sermon would be, Where Your Heart Is. Where Your Heart Is, that's the sermon title for the day. And we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. If you are, um, if you have your copy of God's Word, I encourage you uh, 
to take notes, to, to underline stuff, because God will just bring that back to your mind if you don't have a copy of God's Word for whatever reason, but would like one, we can help you with that as well. Just want to make sure that everybody does. But for those of you who didn't happen to bring a Bible either on your phone or uh, in your lap, uh, we will have the verses on the screens for you behind me, and so you can follow along right there. So I'm going to read. You follow along. Matthew chapter 15, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break tra the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God and forsake for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother what you, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him, and he said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came to him and said, uh, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And he answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles the person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So that's a lot, but we're going to try to really break it down and understand it maybe um, in a new way for you today. You ever been in a situation where you know somebody is checking you out? Now, we're not in high school. I'm not. You're not some of you are. Um, we're not talking about checking you out like, I think they're cute. Let me check them out. That's not what we're talking about. But have you ever been in a situation where somebody is checking you out? Like, you know, maybe a boss, you know what to do. You know they know that you know what to do. But they're watching just to make sure, not that you're doing it right, but you're doing it the way they would do it. Right? Am I the only one that knows what that feels like? Wake up. Nobody knows, right, but me. Okay, well, I, that happens to me a lot. Um, I'm sure. Mainly from my wife, if I'm being really honest. Because y'all don't know how many times, and I love her. Listen, I love her. And I'm, I'm, it's just, you don't know how many times I've heard, what in the world, when she opens the dishwasher. And I'm like, the dishes are in the dishwasher, and they're going to be clean when they come out. But I didn't put them in there. I didn't put dirty dishes in the dishwasher proper. Or how many times I have heard, right? It's not that I didn't do it. It's that I didn't do it right. She's checking it out, making sure I do it right. Or how many times I've heard, uh, did you wipe the stove off? I did. No, you didn't, right? I, and it's because, now, the stove thing, I'll cut her some slack on the stove thing because I probably didn't do it very well. It's just not my cup of tea, right? But you know what I'm talking about. When people are there, and if it's not your spouse, right? We've been married a long time, and so um, we may not be married after today, but hey, it's, we had a good run, okay? We had a good run. Um, but it's not, it's not so bad. It's not awkward when something like that happens. But when it's somebody watching you from the outside, and they're scrutinizing what you're doing, because they want to know that you do it not just the right way, but they want to know you do it their way. It can be awkward when you're confronted with that. Well, Jesus is in, in this awkward type situation because these Pharisees have come. Now, remember, we going back to what 
I hope y'all are keeping up with where we are in the story, right? So Jesus has been doing ministry in these little tri-city areas, right? Anybody name them? No. Capernaum, that's one of them, right? Jesus has been doing the ministry in this three-city little village area, not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the hub. Jerusalem was uh, the hub of religious piety. It was the place to be if you were a religious leader. So he wasn't doing ministry there, but these Pharisees had come, and this is not a 15-minute walk, just, you know, let's just stroll down to the end of the street and see what's going on. This was a journey for them to come and check him out, and that's exactly what they were doing. They came on this journey not just to see what was going on, but they wanted to see if it was being done properly, right? And you th- remember, Jesus has been teaching. He's been preaching. He has been uh, seeing more and more and more people come as he's doing miracles and all those things are happening. The, the crowds are just gathering and gathering and gathering. And guess what happened? Word got back. You, you knew it would, right? Word gets back to them. Hey, there's this teacher who is going around teaching and doing some miracles, and as he's doing these miracles, there's more and more people. People are not just coming to hear him. They're starting to follow him, and so these Pharisees are now saying, well, okay, that's cool as long as got their thumb on top of him, and he's doing it our way because you can't just do good ministry. You've got to do good ministry properly, right? It's got to be done our way. And so they make their journey to see, and they're there checking it out, right? They're there looking, watching everything he is doing, scrutinizing everything that he is doing. And as they are scrutinizing this, uh, the ministry that Jesus is doing, they can't really find anything big, but they, to them it's big, so they say, they call the disciples out, and they say, Hey, uh, so you're teaching these people, but why are your disciples uh, eating with unwashed hands? Now, (laughs) I know for some of you are like, yes, why would you do that? That is gross, right? That's not fun at all. But understand, this has nothing to do with hygiene. That is not what they were talking about. The disciples washed their hands. Listen, wash your hands before you eat if they're dirty. If they're not, it's probably just a good rule of thumb. Wash your hands. I mean, over the last year and a half, have we learned nothing, right? Wash your hands. Cover your mouth when you cough, right? Do those things. Good things to do. No problem there. But they weren't talking about that. They weren't talking about hygiene. It wasn't that the disciples were coming with unwashed hands all together just to the table to eat, picking up, you know, been working outside all day and then come and just pick up bread. You know, that wasn't what they were talking about. They're talking about Your disciples are going to the dinner table, and they are not ceremonially washing their hands. They're not doing it properly. So what you have to understand is that on top of the 613 laws that on the books, the Jewish commandments, there were 613. We were talking about that this morning. How hard would it be? How difficult would it have been? to be in a part of this faith journey at that point in time in history. You had uh, 613 laws that you had to follow that were commandments, the law of Moses. And then on top of that, you had too many to even count, right? Too many to even count man-made laws, not laws, man-made rules that you had to follow follow if you wanted to be a good Jew. And one of those was the ceremonial washing of your hands before. Listen, it had nothing to do with soap and water. It, as a matter of fact, most of the time, the water wasn't even that clean. It was the show of going to the water basin from the tips of your fingers to your elbows, getting wet that and letting the water just run down. And there were some other things, but that was the main part of that. You didn't scrub. You didn't wash anything off. You didn't, that was what it was. And they come to Jesus after checking him out, and they say, hey, listen, 
why do your disciples decide that it's okay to not follow the ceremonial washing of their hands? This is commanded. They say they don't follow. They didn't say they don't follow the command of God because they knew it wasn't a command of God. They say they don't follow the tradition of the elders. Now, we all have been in those places, right? And you say, why, why is that being done that way? Or why do we do that? And they don't really give you a good answer. They say, because that's the way we've always done it, right? And, and so that's okay, and there's nothing wrong. Listen, don't hear me say there's nothing wrong with tradition. There's nothing wrong with tradition. Nothing at all wrong with tradition. What Jesus is saying is, listen, there, be, there comes a time when it becomes a problem if you are putting your traditions above people. If you're putting your traditions above God himself, if you're putting it equal with God's commandments, when you're putting your traditions equal with God's commandments. Um, I grew up, well, actually, I served early on in some some churches that um, it was Jesus is the only way to salvation, right, which is, a, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is scripture. That is Bible, right? But right next, equal with it was don't bring food or drinks into the sanctuary. I'm not kidding. Like, it was, you, they, it was, they could probably quote you a verse that would make that fit. <laughs> don't bring, because traditions had become equal with the word of God. And Jesus is saying, so if you're not careful, you become a false religion you become a false religion now we all know some false religions right if you go to a or a part of a a church a group a denomination anything uh, that says that there is more than it that there's more than one way to get to heaven okay like there's yeah jesus is a way a way but he's not the only way if that's you if you're going to or you know of that that's a false religion. There's no, no other way around that. If there is a, a, if you're a part of anything that says, hey, listen, there's, Jesus was a good teacher, but he wasn't sinless. Well, that nullifies everything we believe about the cross and what, so that's a false religion. Well, Jesus wasn't saying the Pharisees' religion was false. He's saying they began, had begun to worship a false religion because they were no longer worshiping God and the commandments of God they were worshiping man-made traditions and if we're not careful that can be just as bad and so they said hey why don't your disciples follow our rigid extensive ritual of washing their hands before meals now I know to, to us that really seems weird right like Okay, you're going to say to people that that is so important. Wash, ritually washing your hands, being rigid about it, that's so important. And to us, that seems kind of strange. But you have to understand, these Jewish, Jewish people in this time, these ancient Jews, and especially these leaders, they were just as intense and just as serious about their man-made traditions and rituals as they were the word of God. I mean, it was serious. One Jewish rabbi named Jose said this. He said, when you, um, you sin the same if you eat with unwashed hands, ritually speaking, as if you lay with a harlot. Am I the only one that finds that weird? That if I go to the table, with un- it's the same sin It's just as bad a sin as if I go to a prostitute. Really? There's no no leeway in that at all, right? It's just that's how serious they took these man-made traditions. And so Jesus then turns it around on them. Jesus then is saying, okay, let me show you how bad this is. Let me show you how far off you've gotten. And he says, okay, so here's what you've done. You are saying that they are breaking this, this tradition of man by not washing their hands. They're ceremonially washing their hands. And I would say to you, 
what about you breaking the command of God to honor your father and mother? Now, we, we need to know that this ancient time, that honoring your father and mother was huge, especially your father. Sorry, ladies, but that, I mean, it's the reality of the time, especially your father. And so Jewish law, the commandment, Jewish law was that if you had, if, as, as your parents got older, you were supposed to be setting aside some funds, some money, some land, something to take care of your parents. Now, I don't know about you, but I could get on board with that again. Like, I could get on board with us bringing that law back. Am I the only one that did that? Parents, right? I could get on board with that, moving forward. Not, not retroacting it, but, but moving forward. <laughs> but taking care, that was a law. And so they were supposed to, Jewish men were supposed to, set aside some money, set aside some land um, to take care of their parents. But in these Pharisees, these leaders, they were very... They became very selfish. They didn't want to do that. So you know what they did? They created another tradition. They created another uh, law, if you want to say that, man-made, not a command of God. They created a loophole. They created their own loophole. Now, <laughs> political affiliations aside on either one, right? We know, this, <laughs> we know this happens in our world, right? In our own government, they do that. They'll create loopholes for themselves. Well, this is exactly what the religious leaders did. They created a loophole for themselves. They created a loophole called korban. Korban what meant simply this. If you took the land or the money that was supposed to be set aside for your parents and you dedicated it to the temple of God, you didn't have to give them any money. And that's what they were doing. And they were usurping. Now, I'm sure... After their parents were gone, they then somehow had a way to get it back out for themselves. That was the whole point. And Jesus calls them out on it. Jesus says, okay, so they're not ceremonially washing their hands, but you are breaking the commandment of God because you don't honor your father and mother. You're not taking care of your father and mother in their old age. Um. As long as you just say, you don't have to do it. You just got to say, this is set aside for God, not set aside for my parents. Then you're okay. And so Jesus says, Isaiah prophesied about you. He's talking to these religious leaders. Isaiah prophesied about you rightly when he said, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So let me ask you this this morning. What about you and I? What about us? Can we say that we honor God with our lips and our heart? Or would we have to be honest and transparent with ourselves? Like when we look in the mirror, not when we're here. Because listen, we can, we're, we're, very, uh, we're very good at um, appearing, appearing to draw near to God. We're very good at appearing to honor God with our lives. But only you and I, well, only you, only God knows our heart. I can't. I can look at somebody in this church and I can say, "Man, Creed really honors God," but only Creed knows his heart. Because we can, we're really good at appearing to honor God. We're we're social media giants when it comes to putting verses on Facebook, right, or on social media. We we can do that. We appear. But only we look in the mirror. We know. And when you look in the mirror, do you say to yourself, well, the truth is, if, we're, if I'm honest with myself looking in the mirror, what I, what I say, what my church thinks, what my family may even think about who I am is just surface. Because who I really am is not honoring to God. Where my heart is is not really honoring to God. My mouth says I honor God, but my heart says something very different. And if we're not careful, we can go through, Christian people can go through this life 
And everybody thinks, man, they walk with the Lord. Man, they're serving God. Man, they're. But in reality, God knows. And you know your heart is far from him. And only you know that. And Jesus is saying to these religious leaders, right? You get that. These are the religious leaders. These are the ones that they can make you or break you. And Jesus says, man, your heart is not. Oh, yeah, you're good at keeping some rules. You're good at keeping some rituals. You're good at that. But your heart doesn't know God, doesn't long for God, doesn't seek after God, doesn't want anything. Your heart truly doesn't want anything to do with God. You serve rules and rituals more than you serve God. And for us, we have to ask ourselves, is my heart after God? Do I have a heart that seeks and longs to see God and know God and do his will? So Jesus says to the disciples, see, what you have to understand is they're the blind leading the blind. Because Jesus says, what you, he told the crowd, what you have to understand is that what goes in to a person's mouth is not what defiles him. It's what comes out of the heart. That's what defiles a person. He kind of gives them a science lesson, right? He says, okay, when you eat something, it goes in. It is digested, and then it is expelled later on. Jesus dropped some science knowledge on them. And he says, expelled at some point in time. That's not what defiles you. What defiles you is what goes, comes from the heart and comes out of the mouth. That's what, well, what he was saying was, what comes from the heart and comes out of the mouth comes out in your actions, comes out in your thoughts, comes out in the way you treat people, the way you love people or don't. That's what defiles a person. And so when he said, uh, you know, and, and I, I guess I've been watching The Chosen a lot as I think about this could be a hilarious, I think, a hilarious kind of scene that they could set up. Because think about this. You have the religious leaders. The only, like, they're the religious ones. And Jesus has just told them, look, whatever goes in, it's going to come out, and that's not going to, that's not what defiles you. It's what goes in, what comes out of the heart, from the heart, and comes out of your mouth. So they're there, right? And he's, and he's telling them this. The disciples are over here, right? And they're seeing all this happen. And they're going, what is he? I don't want to go to prison today. Do you want to go to prison today? I don't. And Peter's like, I'm not going to prison today. I can just tell you that right now. I'm not going to prison today. And they're like, well, we're going to have to rein him in. I feel like the whole ministry of the disciples, they weren't learning as much as they should have learned because they were trying to just keep Jesus reined in from going too far, right? They're like, okay, we got to stop him because he just insulted the religious. Le you saw their faces, right? Their faces were like they were not happy. And Jesus has insulted these religious. What in the world are we going to do now? Because they've been, we've got to stop him. And can't you see them go and I can Again, Peter, I just think it's probably Peter, right? Comes up, wraps his arm around Jesus, turns him away from the Pharisees and says, hey, listen, dude, do you know what you just did? You just, they were offended. They were insulted. They were offended by what you said. And this is what my, in my imagination, this is what I, how I think Jesus probably responds is, they're not as insulted as they should have been because they still don't fully understand what I said. <laughs> right? They should have been way more insulted than they really are, but they don't really understand it. Because, see, you don't even understand it, Peter. And Peter says, well, then explain it to us. We need to understand this parable. And that's when he said, what comes out of, what comes out of your heart, what comes from your heart and out of your mouth, that's what I'm talking about. That's what defiles you. Peter, the reason that they're offended is because they're the blind leading the blind. They're the blind leading the blind. He even takes it through another step and insults them even, even further. I think, I think Jesus probably said, you think they were offended? 
Peter, do you really think they were offended? Good, because that's what I was going for. I was trying to offend them. I'm trying to let them know the way they do things is no more. We're not going to do things like that anymore. What matters is the heart, not some rule, some arbitrary law or rule that you follow. What matters, Peter, is the heart. It's like the blind leading the blind. If a blind leads the blind, they both fall into the ditch. I started to have two people come up here today, but I thought it would take too long. And the first trip around, one person would close their eyes and the other person would guide them in this square right here, right? And then they would both close their eyes and see if they could make it around the square. But I figured we would hurt somebody or it would, uh, it would take too long because I figured it would be Landon leading Creed. <laughs> and then, and then that Landon is so big, if he closed his eyes and fell on somebody, it would hurt. So I decided I wouldn't do that today. But that's what Jesus is saying. You, do, you Pharisees, you're like the blind leading the blind. You don't even realize what you don't know. And the bad part is you interpret the scripture from a place where you don't even know what God is saying. And you try to tell people this is the way you live. So Jesus says, ultimately, all right, guys, here's the bottom line. What does your heart say about you? Because at the end of the day, Jesus says, that's what really matters. Yes, can you you ceremonially wash your hands and it's okay? Sure, if you want to do that, go ahead. But that is not going to please the Father as much as what your heart says about who you are. What does your heart say about you today? Peter says, hey, explain it to us. And Jesus says, all that really matters is, is your heart clean? Is your heart clean? All those years ago, Jesus stood with his disciples and said, hey, what matters is, is your heart clean? And today, I'm telling you what Jesus would say to us if he were standing here today. He is here. But if he were physically here today, he would say this. What does your heart say about you? Where's your heart today? In relationship to me, in relationship to the Father, where is your heart right now? Where is it? Because whatever you put in, whatever you put in, whatever comes from your heart is going to affect, it's going to impact everything that you do. And so if the most important thing is your heart is clean, then what do we do? What do we do? First John 1 9 says this. If we confess, if we, if we, but if you're a Christian, you know what it should say? When we, when we, so look at your neighbor and say, when we confess, confess. Why? Because here's the truth. If you're if you're a believer, it's when we confess, not if we confess. And if you are a person who doesn't know the Lord yet, if you're still struggling, you're still figuring that out, then it is. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous or faithful and just, some uh, translations say, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Hey, believer, when we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Person that's struggling, if you're just still, you're on the fence, I don't know about this Jesus stuff. If you confess your sins, he will forgive your sin. And you know what that means? You got a right heart with the Father. That's what that means. You got a right heart with the Father. Because where it starts is here, in this place. If you're, if you're still not sure, if you've never said yes to Jesus, this is where it starts. Repentance and faith. Repentance means I confess to God everything. I, God, I know I've messed up. I haven't done what I'm supposed to do. I've been walking this way. You're over here, but I keep walking this way. But I'm going to stop walking this way. I'm going to turn my back to all that stuff, and I'm going to walk toward you. Now, listen, 
It does not mean you will never sin again. I wish I could say that to be the case. Wouldn't that be great? Just give your life to Jesus. You'll never sin again. That would be great. But that's not the reality. So we need this verse as Christians, too. Because here's what happens a lot of times. We turn, we're a new believer, and, man, we are walking with everything we've got right toward Jesus. Everything is good in our lives. And then all of a sudden we start doing this. Right? And we mess up. And when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. So what, what do you do? Well, you are renouncing everything that is not of Christ, repentance and faith. You're putting your faith in him that he is who he says he is and he does what he says he can do. And you're saying the, the pattern and habit and lifestyle of sin it doesn't have a hold on me anymore. The chain is broken. The, bond, the bondage of sin is gone. I don't have to be a captive. To, I'm not a slave to sin anymore. The pattern, lifestyle, and habit, it's gone. And you start walking toward Jesus. Doesn't mean that occasionally you won't get cut off in traffic and scream and yell at the driver who cut you off. And then you go, oh, Lord, that's not who I am anymore. Forgive me for that, right? Or whatever. It doesn't mean that you won't get yelled at by your wife for not wiping the stove down right. And you are wrong because you told her you did it, right? And you have to confess. It just means that as you're going, all this, all the bondage and slavery to sin is gone. And you're walking toward Jesus as much as you can, as fast as you can. And when you slip up, because you will, you can ask for forgiveness. You can confess the sin, ask for forgiveness. And he is faithful to forgive us. And here's the great thing. It doesn't matter if it's yelling at somebody for cutting you off in traffic or it is something that you consider the worst thing in the world. Forgiveness is the same. He is willing to forgive us. Jesus is the only way to have a clean heart. Jesus is the only way to have a clean heart. Whether it is for the first time in salvation or whether you have been walking this way and somehow you've kind of gotten off track. You're starting to get... <laughs> you know, pulled backwards into something that you said you would never go back to. Whatever it is, there's forgiveness. That clean heart can happen. So let me ask you this. What does your heart say about you today? Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful, thankful for your word and for what you do. Um, God, I pray that um, in this moment we would be able to understand that your love for us is, is limitless. That no matter how far off track we think we've gotten, it hasn't taken you by surprise. And whether today we need to say yes to you for salvation or whether today we just need to come and kneel and just ask for forgiveness for some things, God, you will meet us right where we are. We give you this time. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing. Um, there'll be, uh, there's a place to kneel and pray right up here. There's some people standing in the back. You don't even have to come up front. You just go back and grab them. They will pray with you. Um, we have uh, one of our elders and his wife will be up here if you need somebody to pray with up here. I'll be here as well, but whatever God's doing, uh, you let him do that today. Let's sing together. Carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let. 
Running into your arms 